Hi, my name is Danny Collins. I'm a Refco Service Manager with the Tiger Branch here in Oregon. And today we're going to be going over why compressors fail. So let's talk about the reasons a compressor is going to fail. We can break them down into a few categories. One's mechanical, which is anything to do with the lack of lubrication, excessive heat or overheating, contamination or debris. Um, the next is electrical failure. Electrical failure is pretty self-explanatory. That's a short in your windings, a short to ground. Um, and the other is misassembly. Now, misassembly is going to be one of those things that is very rare. I don't want you taking that and going, oh, it's misassembled or it's a factory defect. Because even if you look at the statistics for what happens at the factory when they cut these open and actually inspect them, the no-fault founds are, are an enormous amount. And there's very few that are actually found to be a factory defect or even actually broken. Um, so let's talk about the mechanical failure and the types. Um, lack of lubrication, dilution or washout, um, liquid flood back, a flooded start, overheating, which is low suction pressure, high superheat, low charge, high discharge pressure, and dirty coals. If you look at these, a lot of them fit into two categories, maintenance or our installation. So it's either on the homeowner or on the tech. Something we've done has led to one of these instances. It's going to be the root cause of why the compressor failed. When you talk about lack of lubrication, what about horizontal traps? Are they installed correctly? Are there vertical traps on a long line application? Oil dilution. Is it a flooded start? Is it a liquid flood back? Again, all these, if you look at it, basic installation issues. Are we using the manuals, sizing the unit properly, and doing everything else? When you look at replacing a compressor, the thing to think about when you're troubleshooting a compressor is even if it is a bad compressor, it's not necessarily the problem. The compressors, the, what ended up happening, yes, the compressor went bad, but what was the root cause? What made it happen? Compressors don't just go bad without some kind of outside interference or misassembly. So here's a picture here that just shows a lack of lubrication. You can see the grinding and the scoring on it. I mean, you can tell that thing has just been worn down. Um, let's talk about liquid floodback. Defined as liquid refrigerant, returning to the compressor during running cycle, diluting the oil and reducing viscosity. Um, lack of refrigerant vaporization, low load, low airflow, and refrigerant overcharge. Now, again, I, I keep hammering on this because it's important. A lot of these things are because of installation or repair issues that we've had some impact on. Low load, did we design it properly? Did we size it, size it properly? Low airflow, did we design the duct system properly? And refrigerant overcharge. If you don't know don't guess. Make sure you're either weighing in and out or you're using your gauges appropriately to get the right charge into these units, not just throwing some in there because you think it's down. Liquid flood back, this is what it looks like. Uh, this is what happens on the inside. You can see the scoring and actually the it's, it's just worn on both sides, but you notice the bearing. Um, that bearing is just shot. It actually, when you took out the scroll and turned it upside down, it just falls right out of there. There's nothing there left. Um, next is slugging. Liquid refrigerant moves through the crankcase as a vapor, condenses into a liquid, and at the startup, the oil floating on top of the refrigerant rushes back in into the flank, and then it slugs the compressor. Now, what happens is basically the internal components of that scroll just explode. It literally looks like somebody put a bomb in there. All the little swirl patterns are gone, they're blown out, and you'll have pieces of metal everywhere. Um, there's some things you can do for prevention. Use a crankcase heater. Make sure it's working appropriately when you're doing maintenance. Maintain proper system charge and follow the manufacturer long line guide when applicable. Basic installation, make sure we're following all the proper installations and sizings and you should be good to go. When you do maintenance, make sure we're checking on those crankcase heaters. Make sure everything's good to go with those as well. This is an example of what I was talking about with slugging. You can see on the left all the pieces sitting there with that scroll. And then on the right, you see a scroll where you can see the design pattern, but it is absolutely gone and all the pieces are laying there in front of it. Um, if you look inside in the middle picture, you can see that on the inside there's some damage done to the actual bearing as well. So overheating. What causes overheating? Um, high return gas temp or high superheat, high compression ratio high discharge, low suction, and undercharge or loss of charge. Now, loss of charge, 
right. We just got to figure out why it lost charge. Um, but under charge, that's on us. So make sure for everything that we go out to troubleshoot on a unit, we need to not just look at are we replacing the component, but we need to be really diligent about are we getting to the root cause? What caused this failure? What caused the loss of refrigerant? Why did the, what did the loss of refrigerant do to the compressor? So before I put this new compressor in, am I going to make sure that this doesn't happen to this brand new one? Um, here's some stepware. Now, stepware, if you'll notice, right there on the inside curl of the uh, compressor scroll, you're going to see a little step. And that step is caused when you have high compression ratio because of the way that it rubs against each other on its axis. Um, you can see on the inside the scrolling and divots that are left around it. It's easy to tell when you see this. That step where it's really just obvious and you know right then there's a high compression ratio on this. Contamination failures. Now contamination failures are completely on us after we replace that compressor. Compressor burnout, things like that, I get it, they happen, but if it happens and we leave contamination on the system in the system, that is on us. Was the system properly evacuated? Were proper insulation practices used? You'll hear this a lot through here. Was there a previous failure that introduced moisture or acid in the system, compressor burnout, and did we follow the protocol to treat the system and make sure it doesn't happen again? Um, Contamination failures are usually a couple reasons, but a lot of times you'll see contamination that we introduce into the system. Like if you look look at this short video, you'll notice no nitrogen, just going in and brazing away. Now, once that's connected, what happens to all the soot on the inside? Where does that go and what does it do to the system? Well, if you look on the left here, you'll see the copper plating that happens within the scroll. That's because that contaminant, the acid inside of it, causes the copper plating to strip inside of the actual pipe, the tubing on your line sets and it's transferred over to the scroll where it deposits and changes it from the black or the uh, silver that you'll see to the copper plating. Um, foreign debris. Foreign debris is usually something, again, that we can prevent and something that we introduce into the system um, by not paying attention to detail. You'll see on these pictures, you see the copper debris and the copper embedded into the flanks of the scroll. But where do those come from? So one of the key things that we see is when you're using your deburring tool, which way is the pipe facing? You know, if you're using a deburring tool, are you holding the pipe upright, deburring it, and then laying it down and connecting it? Because now all of the burrs that you actually got off the pipe are inside, and they're headed straight to that compressor. So just, you know, be diligent about how you use your tools. Types of electrical failures. Now, electrical failures are pretty simple. Um, there's three kinds of failures, basically. Uh, one is a general burn or entire wiring burn, um, which is caused by voltage, or your motor running hot. Pretty simple to understand, but the big thing is the motor was running hot. What caused the motor to run hot? Voltage. Did we get a huge voltage increase? Where did it come from and why? Is it going to happen again? When I replace this compressor, how do I stop that from occurring again? Spot burns. Rapid voltage spike. Foreign material, like the deburring, when I told you it was headed straight to that compressor, this is where it ends up, right in the winding. It shorts a couple of those thousands of strands together and when it shorts the right ones together you've got a problem and then the start winding the start winding 90 percent of the time you're going to find that is from your start gear so go back check your capacitors check all your gear make sure everything's up and within the specifications it's supposed to operate um, on the left you'll see a turn to turn short on the right you'll see an edge of the winding short these are probably the most common ones we see um, and then on the next slide, you see the grounded in the slot. This one, if you see grounded in the slot, there's no doubt in your mind that you've had some kind of debris go through that system. And that is going to be the indicator. Now, you're probably never going to see most of the, these things because you're never going to cut the compressor open. But 
we can test the unit to find out what's going on and it gives us a good idea to know how to address it right so when i look and i have it short in my winding i need to be looking at electrical issues or debris what happened here if i go over there and i've got issues with the sound of the motor you know if i've got issues with the motor not starting up on that then i know that i probably have a mechanical issue let's look at the pressures let's look at root cause what caused this to fail the biggest thing i want anyone to take away from here is a how to identify the failures through troubleshooting and understanding what it looks like and what it does to the compressor but the other is is to be diligent about getting to root cause rather than replacing compressor after compressor here's a few troubleshooting tips um, so if you go out and the unit starts up but the compressor does not start is there correct voltage so is your voltage going to the compressor do we have the correct voltage going into the unit is our capacitor against start gears capacitor inspects and what about our contactor i see a lot of times that contractors go in and they have replaced the contactor and then another contractor has to go out there and when they look at it they just oh we yeah, have the contactors there it's not pulled in i don't know what's up but if you look down at the wiring diagram there's just two little wires that are swapped so always look at that contactor and make sure it's pulling in and make sure that it's wired correctly uh, low pressure cutout, high pressure cutout, you know, what's your suction discharge? Is it balanced? Um, do an ohm check. Ohm checks are going to be one of your biggest saviors. You can go out, you can go run to common and start to common, and then that should equal your run to start value. If you're going to test it to ground, you're going to go from run to ground, start to ground, common to ground, and when you do those, you should have an infinite or open reading. If you have anything other than that, then we have an issue with it going to ground and you should be looking at what caused that short, right? Now, if it starts and it's short cycling, low pressure cut out, high pressure cut out, loose wires. If it trips immediately, correct voltage. Do we have the correct capacitor? Is the capacitor within the readings? The key to ones that trip immediately or give you a fault immediately, unhook your compressor, especially on these new inverter systems. If you unhook your compressor, turn this unit on, and it throws the exact same code that you were getting and shuts off with the compressor unhooked, it's not your compressor. Start looking at the inverter board and troubleshooting and hops, hopscotching backwards to find out what happened there. Um, if it gives nothing and it fan starts up and everything works, now let's focus on that compressor. Let's find out. Do we have short in the windings? Do we have a short to ground? What's happening with this? What mechanical failure occurred and why? Did it occur um, if you have a noisy one I, I mentioned noise earlier learn the sounds of compressors especially scroll compressors you can hear the different sounds sounds like a box of marbles you can hear the winding the grinding the different sounds that they make based on specific failures this will help you walk up and kind of know where to start just based on sound I mean we have a lot of senses available to us when we step out on the job site use them all use your smell use your hearing and your eyesight and your touch to know what's going on. All right, so some prevention. I've mentioned this multiple times throughout this training. I know it's been redundant, but I want to pound it in. Manuals are your friend. Installation manuals are your friend. We are definitely here to help you any way that you need, but the important part is you do your due diligence. Correct equipment sizing. Use the installation manuals, the product data sheets. Uh, proper insulation practices, nitrogen when you're purging, no oil traps, deep vacuums. You know, did we get 500 microns or did this thing only get to 320 at insulation? Well, that's an issue. We know right then we got to figure something out. So make sure those numbers and those guidelines are there for a reason. Carrier has spent a lot of money designing the proper insulation of these to help prevent issues in the future. Just do everything you can to get those numbers. And if you can't, Call us, let us help you figure out why, so that we can make this customer, this unit, and you all look good. Airflow, one of the biggest things that we always talk about is airflow. Airflow seems to be a major issue throughout our industry, and it has a major impact on these compressors. You know, proper duct sizing. Look at airflow as the lifeblood of this other than refrigerant. If you're putting too much stress on this compressor because you have airflow issues you shorten the life of this compressor this unit and 
all it was was because you didn't use proper duct sizing or we didn't put the one more vent or a vent was too small. Make sure we're doing the right things. Proper refrigerant charge, again, it's all on us, right? When we did the installation, was there a piston change necessary based on the model we're using in the application? Did we see it in the manual or did we read the manual or did we just assume? Um, charge. Make sure you're looking at these units. There's a number of units out there that are only fit for a certain amount of footage and you have to take some refrigerant out or put some refrigerant in in almost every single application. So make sure you're looking at it. Don't assume that everything's 0.6 per foot. You know, go in and look at the manual. I think it's always better for us to go in and look at something and take a couple minutes. That little ounce of prevention can prevent all kinds of headaches. So use the ounce of prevention, follow proper troubleshooting and insulation and sizing techniques, and you'll have a successful compressor in your unit. So now that we're done with the slideshows, pictures are great, but we wanted to go through and show you some actual scrolls that we got from Copeland. They'd cut the actual compressors open to look see what kind of failure there was. You don't want to know how many compressors had to be pulled and opened in order to find the actual faults that were labeled on them, um, but we do have some very good examples of what happens in the scenarios we talked about today. So the first one we're going to go through is step wear. Now on step wear, if you look in, and remember this is on high compression situations, you're going to see this little step right on the inside of the scroll. And you'll notice on the actual head itself, it does the same here. The other thing is, is if you actually look inside, everything starts at the bearings. You can see the bearing is taken where. Can you see that? You can see the bearing is taken where, and that's because it keeps pushing up and rubbing against this, against the axis. Now, the next one is dilution. When we talk about dilution and washout, um, as you can tell, it caused some more issues, right? Um, because it starts to overheat. But you see the grinding inside and the discoloration that happens inside there, that light tint, along with all of the just wear and grinding on here. These things should be in here and floating on their axis right and they have some some axis here and room to move but instead these things are just wearing on each other and you can see it on the back side we talked about the bearing taking the brunt of it i mean this thing just falls out so you know what happens with those next we go to liquid flood back now liquid flood back is going to be about the same as solution you'll notice the wear and tear you don't see the tinting though right there's no tinting on it from anything inside. It's just wear and tear on the inside on the actual scrolls themselves. Bearing shot. Now, this right here is a prime example of debris. Now, on the inside, and you can see the copper inside. Now, remember, Debris is going to be different than if we have a contaminant. Both have copper in them, right? You're going to see copper coloring, co copper discoloration when we have a contaminant. But with debris, you're going to see the actual flakes inside where these were rubbing together and the scrolls would get caught in there. And as it got caught in the scroll and the pressure in there, it would actually grind into the metal and make a spot rather than an entire area being discolored from some contaminant. And you also notice the bearing's great right because these pieces are just getting run in there now the problem is is the ones that get through because where do those end up those end up inside of our windings causing our shorts which now has given us an electrical failure the next one i love this one we had a couple to choose from but i chose this one specifically because it's used right it looks used everything else you'll notice there's bearings pretty clean there's nothing inside there there's no scoring nothing really wrong there and inside again if you look inside the scroll there's some wear in there but it's not wear as in grinding the motor the actual metal is not exposed because of grinding this is just a normal compressor that had not a single fault wrong with it that was turned in um, it's a pretty good looking scroll and then finally this one should be pretty easy for everybody um, as soon as I do this because this one is slugging. 
And this is why it's so important that we follow installation practices. Completely blows everything out on this. There's nothing left here. The back is barely ground. It didn't have time to wear this out. It didn't have time to wear the plating out. It didn't have time to wear this out. It literally exploded like a bomb inside. So this was shot just because of slugging. And again, we have root causes and then we have other causes, right? Look at the melting on side of this. So now we got to try, try to look at the melting on side of this. Now you got to trace down your wires. You got to make sure all your wires are good. Do I have any opens in the wires? Are they all complete? Everything connecting properly? There's a lot of things that happen and we have to be diligent about what we do when we do these. Again, you'll probably never see the inside of these compressors unless you're in a training course, but you absolutely will be able to hear the failures that we're talking about today and measure them through the testing that we talked about during the slideshow. Thank you very much for your time. Again, my name is Danny Collins, a Refco service manager at the Tigard branch. If you do need to contact me or have any questions or concerns regarding this training, please feel free to contact me at the information below. Thank you for your time.